Exar Kun was born on an unknown planet, sometime between 4040 and 4020 BBY. And like most young children, he was discovered by the Jedi Order as highly force sensitive, and subsequently he was taken to the Jedi Academy on Dantooine. He was assigned as a Padawan under Master Vodo Siosk Bas, along with two Cathar life mates known as Krado and Silver. During his training, Exar was fueled by the desire of becoming one of the greatest Jedi ever, and as he trained, his skills with a lightsaber became almost unparalleled. However, within this burning desire lay pride and arrogance, and Exar believed himself ready to learn about all kinds of forbidden knowledge restricted to those of Jedi Knight status and above, despite only being a Padawan. In 3997 BBY, Exar snuck into his master's hut and opened his holocron, learning for the first time about the fallen Jedi turned Sith Lord Freedon Nard. However, before he could fully learn about the information of the Sith on this holocron, Master Bass caught him, taking away the holocron and criticising his young apprentice for his curiosity on such forbidden topics. A short time after, nearing the end of his lightsaber training, Exar was sent for dueling practice with his training partners Krado and Silver. During the duel, Exar initially clashed sabers with Krado, defeating him quickly with complete ease. However, Silver was not as weak as Krado, and the two engaged in a furious duel in which Exar began to taunt the young Cathar, insulting her heritage. It's time you learned that animal Jedi are no match for humans. Silver, in a fit of rage, unsheathed her claws, slashing them across Exar's face, leaving what would be a nasty scar. Exar was shocked and centered himself into his own rage. He overpowered with ease the Cathar girl, nearly killing her until Master Bar stepped in and disarmed him. A defeated Krado, though, threw to him his own lightsaber, daring him to challenge their master, a dare which Exar didn't refuse. Master and apprentice dueled, but Bas quickly found a point of weakness in Exar's form and sent his apprentice flying with a single strike using a simple wooden staff. Spotting his own lightsaber on the ground, Exar, using the force, summoned it to him. Now armed with two lightsabers, he summoned the same rage and strength that he used against Silva, going on the offensive, launching a vicious assault on his master. After several minutes of dueling, Exar slashed and cut his master's staff in two, winning the duel, with his master proclaiming Exar to be his greatest student. After becoming a Jedi Knight shortly after, Exar left Dantooine and his master due to his hunger to learn about the Sith, especially Freedon Nard, and so he took his personal starship, the Star Storm One, and travelled to Onderon where the Sith Lord once reigned. He posed as a Jedi archaeologist, meeting with the Jedi K. Keldroma and Tok Dinita, who were supervisors on a project where the Jedi were turning Freedon Nard's ancient buried starship into a Jedi outpost. However, Exar was interested in Sith artifacts found at the resting place of Onderonian King Omin. However, the two Jedi had been ordered to ship them off-world to the Jedi Library on Ossus, instead offering him a mere tour of Freedon's court in the Onderonian city of Isis. Despite Exar's insistence to study them, Keldroma and Danita's master, Arkijeth, arrived on his Tang Drexel. Arka knew that Exar was lying about his identity and ordered him to leave Onderon trying to banish the curious Jedi from the planet for his fascination with the dark side. Although despite his fascination with the dark side, Exar simply thirsted for knowledge and was devoted to the light. He brushed the Jedi Master's threat of banishment off and proceeded into Isis to continue his investigations alone. As he travelled through the city, he noticed two Freedon Nard sympathisers known as Nebo and Rask being heckled by a crowd for preaching about the Sith Lord and Exar saw this as a potential opportunity to gather information. He helped the two out of a difficult spot and wanted information in return. They revealed that Friedenard's tomb was located on Duxen, the jungle moon of Onderon, and in return for gold, Exar convinced them to take him to it. When they arrived on the moon, Exar ventured to the temple alone, cutting through the beasts that had been used to protect the tomb from thieves and grave robbers. However, when he reached the building itself, it was completely encased in Mandalorian iron, a metal that lightsabers couldn't cut. After several failed tries to get through, Exar felt a strange power surrounding him, as if something wanted to help him get through. On his next try, the metal was completely obliterated, 
and Exar could faintly hear the call of his former master, Bodo Bass, trying to convince him to go no further, but he proceeded anyway. As he walked through this tomb, he finally came across the very corpse of Friedenard himself, but before he could do anything, the spirit of the dead Sith Lord emerged from the skeletal remains. What kind of madman are you who dares to violate my final resistance? Despite Exar's attempts at convincing himself that Nard was merely a dangerous spirit, the Sith Lord offered him a gift. Take the corpse out of the sarcophagus. The shaken Jedi could once again hear the voice of his master, Vodo Bass, through the Force, but his curiosity drove him to follow the order of the Sith Lord. When he removed the body, he found ancient scrolls. These scrolls would lead him to the Sith homeworld of Korriban. Freedon Nard's spirit then miraculously disappeared, and as Exar left the temple, he was ambushed by Nebo and Rask, who wanted the loot for themselves. But Exar gave into his anger, and the dark power of Freedon igniting his lightsaber, striking the two men down in a fit of fury. When he calmed, he realised what he had just done, distressed over how easily he gave in to the touch of the dark side that Freedon had planted. But despite this, he was determined to press on, and this distress turned into excitement. Exar landed the Star Storm 1 on the dusty red surface of Korriban, in an area what was known as the Valley of the Dark Lords. He walked through the valley, looking at the tombs around him and at the corpses of dead space pirates, but as he did, dark energies swirled around the bones and the skeletons, now reanimated, began to attack the Jedi. He ignited his lightsaber, defending himself, striking down the walking remains, but Frieden's spirit had once again appeared and beckoned him to take refuge in the nearby Great Temple, and Exar did, but as he entered he felt uneasy, as the power of the dark side here was unlike anything he had ever felt. He decided to return to his ship to plan a course of action, but before he could turn back, a landslide blocked the entrance, and Exar was forced to press on. As he made his way into the temple, he came across a giant crystal which Frieden explained held the souls of slain Jedi Masters. As Exar peered into the crystal, Frieden used the energy of the temple to collapse the roof, destroying the crystal itself, killing the Jedi souls, and shattering Exar's bones in a hundred places. As Exar anguished in agonising pain, he cried for the help of his former master Vodo Bass, who could hear the screams of his Padawan from light years away. Vodo tried to meditate, to protect Exar in a bubble of pure light energy, but Frieden manifested himself on the ship, throwing Vodo against the metal in a hole, breaking his connection to his dying student. The Sith spirit returned to the dying Exar, offering him a proposition. Your skeleton is shattered. If you want to live, accept the dark side. And as much as Exar tried to refuse, he knew he couldn't die. He had come too oh. far. Oh. I accept your terms. Damn you. I, I said I accept. And just like that, after truly opening himself up to the dark side, his bones began to restructure and heal. However, this came with a pain unlike anything he had ever felt, and his cries of pain could be heard by Jedi from across the entire galaxy. But from this pain rose a man who had never felt so strong. Frieden and Exar proceeded further into the tomb, and Exar realised he was now able to read Sith writing found on the sarcophagi of a number of dead Sith Lords. However, despite giving in to the dark side a short while prior, he reiterated his devotion to the light. But as he spoke, two Carter guardians leapt from the shadows, attacking Kuhn, who mysteriously found that his ability to call upon the light side of the Force was completely blocked. With the Hound's teeth at his throat, Exar once again called upon the dark side, this time with less hesitation to summon his lightsaber, slaying the beasts with a series of precise slashes. The spirits of the dead Sith Lords who resided in the tomb could be heard whispering approving of the Jedi's growing dark power. Freedom then beckoned Exar to travel to Yavin 4, to recover the remnant artifacts of the Sith Lord Nargis Sadow that were left behind following his death, and Exar agreed. I am going to Yavin 4, but unlike you, I will never be seduced by the dark side. <laughs> oh, but you already have. 
Exar exited hyperspace over Yavin 4 and landed his ship near one of the temples that dotted the moon's surface. As he left, once again the spirit of Friedenard began to talk to him, warning him of the Masasi, a race of creatures mutated by Nagasadal into being loyal slaves. But Exar rebuked Nard's help and ignored the spiritual Sith Lord. As he tried to press on, however, just as Nard had warned, a group of hideously mutated creatures jumped the Jedi. They threw metal discs at Exar, who once again found himself unable to call upon the light side of the Force to defend himself, and as a result he was struck over the head, causing him to lose focus and balance. This allowed a horde of Masasi to knock him down, overwhelm and capture him, while he watched them rip his ship apart. He was brought before the priest, known as Zithmanir, who could sense Exar's power and ordered his soldiers to take him to the Temple of Fire. When they arrived, Exar was chained to some sort of altar, being called an honoured Jedi guest of a blood sacrifice of the Masasi. As Zithmanir began chanting and dark energy swelled around the temple, Exar began to wonder why the light had abandoned him in his moments of need. But before he could think of anything else, the temple began to shake, which broke his chains and flung him from the altar. As he stood, a giant Sith Wirim, a monstrous creature created by Nargis Sadal to protect his legacy, emerged from the ground, grabbing Exar. The guest had now become the victim and the giant beast had begun to squeeze the life out of the once again dying Jedi. But Frieden Nard's spirit was there again, telling Exar to give into the dark side. It was now that Exar truly let go of his futile belief that he wasn't consumed by darkness and fully abandoned the Jedi way. He found that giving in purely to dark side energy, he could speak in the Sith tongue and channeled his rage and hatred, calling to him the Sith amulet that Zithmanir was wielding, an amulet that belonged to Nargis Sadal. This amulet would allow Exar to channel the dark side a thousand times what he normally could, increasing his power beyond anything he could ever hope to believe. Yes, Nard. I believe I begin to understand. Exar focused this power into a beam of uncontrollable, pure, physical dark side energy that physically burned the fallen Jedi's flesh as he summoned it. But the more pain he felt, the more powerful the beam became, shredding through the hide of the Wirim, killing it as well as countless amounts of Masasi who were caught within the blast radius. The Masasi that survived bowed and pledged their allegiance to their new master, and although the power of the amulet almost consumed him, he was victorious. Frieden, elated at Exar's success, applauded the fallen Jedi, declaring it time to finally work on Nagasadal's alchemy that could give Frieden a physical form. I am hungry to reacquire flesh and life and power. But Exar was sick of Frieden and his manipulative ways. Power? Yes. There is power. Exar looked at the spirit of the irritating Sith Lord and just like that used the amulet to obliterate him, killing him for a second time. But unbeknownst to Exar, Frieden's spirit in its last moments reached out to Satao and Alima Kito of the Kraft Cult, a dark side imbued pair of students he had away from Exar, who conquered the Empress Teta system using Sith magic. Frieden warned them of the fallen Jedi's newfound power and the threat that he posed, and that he must be destroyed as he was a pretender to the Sith legacy. But just a few seconds later, Frieden Nard was no more. This was Exar Kun's destiny, and he wouldn't be controlled by anyone because his reign of terror was about to begin. After expelling the spirit of Frieden Nard and embracing the dark side, Exar established his dominance over the Masasi and ordered them to build great temples that followed ancient Sith designs, which were supposed to draw in and focus extreme amounts of dark side energy that Exar hoped to one day harness. The power of the dark side was now Exar's obsession, and he would do anything to obtain it, and alongside the great temples, the Masasi built monuments and statues in his honour, revering him as their god king. Alongside a temple built personally for Exar, the Masasi were forced to build a temple that would come to be known as the Palace of the Woolamander. Inside this temple, Exar built a strange golden sphere, a dark side artifact that held the very souls of all of the Masasi children, drawing upon their energy to increase his own as well as to further his control over the species. 
As some time passed, Exar was eventually drawn back to the Temple of Fire, in which he finally gave into the dark side, believing that the Sith Wirrim he destroyed was placed to protect something valuable. When he arrived, he looked into the dark pit from where the Wirrim came and jumped in. To his shock, the Sith Wirrim was protecting a giant hangar that harboured Naga Salau's flagship, known as the Corsair, which brought the Masasi species to Yavin 4 a long time prior. But although elated at finding the ship, his new way off world, Exar was drawn to something even more mesmerising, an alchemy lab which belonged to Naga Sadow himself. Inside the lab were Sith scrolls and teachings that had long been lost, and Exar was particularly interested in the teachings that taught the ways of creating and modifying living beings. To test some of his newfound knowledge, Exar convinced priest Sithmanir into being his first subject, by claiming that the ritual caused no pain and that he wanted to turn a warrior into a god. The Masasi priest was placed into a machine and Exar channeled the dark power of the Temple of Fire, melding it with his alchemy. Let's see if the Sith writings speak the truth, or whether they are the mad mutterings of superstitious ancients. After an excruciating transformation, Zithmanir emerged. His body was fused with a form of biometallic armour, his bones and muscles increased in size, his skin hardened and deadly claws had developed on his hands. To further this, using his own physicality as a template, Exar infused Zithmanir with the dark side itself, allowing the priest to feel the touch of the force. And despite the priest's suffering, Exar deemed this a success and proceeded to experiment on other Masasi as well as many other creatures on the moon. Some time afterwards, after he determined that the Corsair was perfectly preserved, Exar was ready to fly off world and bring about the destruction of the Sith magicians taught by Friedenard's spirit that threatened his dominion, which his amulet warned him about. Exar jumped out of hyperspace over the planet Empress Teta, landing the Corsair away from the capital city of Sinegar. Taking two Masasi with him, Exar ventured into the city, and as he walked his amulet began to glow indicating that not only were his enemies near, but they possessed an amulet themselves, the mate of his very own. Knowing of the danger that the amulet posed, Exar knew he would have to act quickly, but before he could go any further, Jedi bombers as well as flying war beasts appeared out of nowhere, breaching the Citadel's defences, attacking the city. Following the path led by the Jedi and Tetan defenders' destruction, Exar finally made his way into the Iron Citadel, the royal palace of Sinegar. As he announced his arrival, the Jedi Ulik Keldroma and Alima Kito were embracing one another, who immediately turned to the fallen Jedi. Ulik ignited his lightsaber, and Alima began to conjure some form of Sith magic, but with a single blast of pure dark energy from his amulet, Exar removed the Sith magician from the duel, igniting his own lightsaber and engaging Ulik. The fight was fast, aggressive and intense, but the two were so evenly matched in their forms, neither could break the other. However, as their lightsabers clashed, dark energies began to swirl around the two amulets, engulfing the two men in a vision, showing them what seemed to be the old Sith Empire. A being wearing a horned helmet approached the men. Cease. You are the chosen. Ulik and Exar looked upon the menacing figure, bewildered. I know him. I've seen his remains on Korriban. It matters not who I am. I complete your initiation. Because of you, the Sith will never die. You have earned the title, Dark Lord of the Sith. The Sith being reached out, laying two fingers on Exar's forehead, burning a mark, a symbol of the ancient Sith, into his skin. As Exar anguished in pain, the being turned to Ulik, declaring the Jedi to be Exar's foremost Sith apprentice, burning the same symbol onto his skull too. In my time, as the Republic battles us to extinction, we secure the future, when the Sith will take their revenge. As the vision of the Empire and the Sith Man dissipated, the newly declared Sith Lords, radiating with unfathomable amounts of dark energy, clasped each other's hands. Together, we will bring down the galaxy. As their planned war was on its eve, Exar and Ulik strove to conquer the entire Empress Teta system. Exar unveiled a super weapon that he had unearthed on Yavin 4, the Dark Reaper, 
and coupled with a machine of his own design known as the Force Harvester, the two machines would combine and the energy drained from the Harvester would become a deadly purified beam of destruction projected by the Dark Reaper. Through Alima's Krath Cult, the Dark Reaper was used to destroy any resistance in their conquest of the system. But after six months, Exar knew that his conquest would require more than just he and Ulik, and so he travelled to the Jedi Library world of Ossus in his repaired Star Storm 1. Exar's business, as well as his fall from the light, had gone almost unnoticed within the Republic, and using this to his advantage, he posed as a Jedi Knight, preaching to a gathered crowd about how their Order and Masters had failed them, refusing them access to forbidden knowledge that he could offer instead. To boast, he revealed that it was he who had destroyed the spirit of Friedenard, a spirit which had been involved in the death of respected master, Arkajeth. To back up this claim, he revealed his Sith amulet, calling it a Jedi amulet. Through it, he revealed a vision of him destroying Friedenard's spirit once and for all, avenging the Jedi Master. He left the Jedi students to ponder upon his proposal and stumbled across a hut in the Great Library, where he overheard Jedi Master Odin Ur talk with Nomi Sunrider about a rare Sith holocron that he intended to find. Exar waited for Nomi to leave, and when she did, the holocron in Odin's hand began to glow crimson red, and it began to shake. Then, it was swooped out of his hand by an unknown force. He looked over to Exar Kun, a stranger to him, but a dark presence nonetheless. Dark Jedi. The Jedi Master summoned a blast of light-sided power out of his frail body to fling Exar across the room, but his power was minuscule compared to the intruder, who arose and declared himself not a Jedi, but a Dark Lord of the Sith, and retaliated, blasting him with power amplified by the amulet, knocking the 1,000-year-old Jedi Master to the floor. Odan became one with the Force, watching in his last moments as a new evil had acquired an artifact of great power as he passed. The group of Jedi who he was preaching to rushed to the scene after looking for Exar and were shocked to see Odan's passing. However, Exar lied, claiming that Odan had offered the Jedi Holocron as a gift after promoting him to Jedi Master and that he simply passed of old age. Some of the gullible Jedi, including Os Willem, his former friend Krado, Zona Luca, and Nayama Bindo, accepted Exar's explanation and agreed to follow him. The group of almost 20 Jedi got aboard the Star Storm 1 with Exar, and while the ship was en route to Yavin 4, he found a private moment to contact his apprentice. After explaining that he acquired his Jedi, Ulik explained that he had gained the loyalties of the Mandalorians, and that he had plans of his own. I am attacking Coruscant at once. Fool, you'll jeopardize my whole plan. We must build slowly. Then we will attack together. The Mandalorian leader, Mandalore the Indomitable, interjected. I don't know who you are, but Ulik and I can handle Coruscant. Very well. Prove your manhood. If you fail, I will go on without you. The Star Storm 1 exited hyperspace over the stormy moon of Yavin 4 and landed in the dense jungle. Exar took the Jedi through it towards one of the temples. However, Os Willem expressed his fear that the moon was shrouded by the dark side, and that perhaps Exar was not being truthful. He turned back, but was jumped by a group of the native Masasi. The rest of the Jedi ran to his aid, igniting their lightsabers in his defense to fight off the creatures. But Exar called them off expressing the truth that Yavin 4 was indeed a place of darkness, but that he was intent on purifying the moon with the light. Although some such as Krado truly believed in him, others were not still fully convinced. Exar stood upon the steps of his own temple, admitting that the Holocron was in fact Sith, not Jedi, but that he would use his power of the light to destroy it. He ordered the Jedi to raise their hands to protect their eyes from the blinding light of its destruction, and wore a sinister smile as he shattered the ancient relic. The holocron itself contained the spirits of long dead Sith, and while some escaped as purple mist, others found a new home. Countless amounts of sharp shards from the holocron were flung towards the Jedi, stabbing into their raised hands and being absorbed into their flesh. Through the shards, the Sith spirits invaded the minds of the Jedi, showing them the power of the dark side and corrupting them, their thoughts almost to becoming the Jedi's own. Krado, however, wasn't affected but stayed loyal to Exar regardless. Exar reorganized the group of Jedi into the Brotherhood of the Sith, and their first task was to eliminate their own Jedi Masters. 
Krado was sent to help Oss, as Exar planned to deal with their own master, Vodo Bass. Exar watched his new Sith leave the moon in their own ships, and as he prepared to leave in his own, to his surprise a ship entered orbit and landed near him. Mandalore himself came down the ramp, explaining to Exar that Ulic had been captured by the Republic and was being sentenced on Coruscant. Unsurprised but seeing opportunity, going against his original stance he boarded Mandalore's ship and headed to Coruscant along with a group of Masati warriors. Landing on the planet without any resistance, the group marched into the Republic Senate Hall, with Exar using a form of Sith magic to freeze the crowd. He freed a thankful Ulic and made his way up to the pulpit where the Chancellor stood while Ulic and the Masasi held off some unfrozen Jedi defenders. The Chancellor attempted a futile swing of his stick towards the Sith Lord, which was blocked, and Exar grabbed his head, using the amulet to take control of the Chancellor like a puppet, proclaiming through him that the Republic will fall and the Sith will rise, all while the frozen onlookers watched in despair as the Chancellor died when Exar released his grasp. With his announcement made, Exar, Ulic, Mandalore and the Masasi began to make their exit. However, Master Bar stepped out, insisting that Exar speak with him. Exar sought to use this talk to convince Vodo to join the Sith, but as expected his master was resilient, who was instead trying to convince him to rejoin the Jedi. But both of their efforts were unsuccessful, and Exar ignited his Cyan Blue Blade while Master Bass simply raised his stick, just like on Dantooine before. The fight between them was vicious and fast-paced but precise, a showing of two elite duelists. After several minutes, neither managed to gain an upper hand, and Exar stepped back for a moment. To change things up, he raised his lightsaber in the air, revealing something that had never been seen before. From the opposite end of the hilt, a second blade ignited, something that Master Vodo had no real understanding of to defend against. Exar, now wielding a completely unique double-bladed lightsaber, pressed the assault on his master, outmaneuvering him completely. After a few more minutes, an accepting Bass warned Exar that this would not be their last fight, but the Sith Lord, like he did on Dantooine, sliced utterly through the center of Master Bass's stick, but this time, it struck him down. The Kravaki Jedi Master became one with the Force, and Silva, distraught at the loss of Bass, rushed towards Exar, but he threw her back with the Force, and the Sith Lords left the planet, returning to Yavin 4. Exar's war was causing major devastation. System after system was being conquered by the combined Krath and Mandalorian forces, and the Republic was being stretched on multiple fronts. To add to things, the Dark Reaper was causing unstoppable chaos, and the Brotherhood of the Sith had crippled the Jedi Order, with eight of the most highly respected masters being assassinated. And despite the deaths, failures, and capture of several members such as Oss, Zona, and Nayama, the war was currently a massive success. Exar, Ulic, and Mandalore discussed what to do next, especially with the traitor Alima. But a ship arrived and a defeated Krado exited, begging Exar for forgiveness after he failed to help Oss defeat and then get captured by Jedi Master Thon. Exar, although internally angered, forgave him, but he saw this as an opportunity. The Corsair, Nargisadal's flagship, would finally be used in battle. The ship harboured a Sith superweapon that contained crystals with enough power to pull the cores out of the stars. The Corsair was to lead an attack on the Kemplex 9 jump station to draw out the Jedi and Republic fleet so the superweapon could be used to destroy them. Elima, intent on seeing the ship's power, and Krado intent on making up for his mistakes, jumped at the chance to lead the assault, to which Exar slyly agreed to. Exar and Ulic, however, covered up their true plan, using it as a ruse for their real goal, to open a simple pathway to the Jedi Library on Ossus while removing the treacherous Elima and the nuisance that was Krado from the equation. Although Exar felt some slight regret, sending a loyal subject to his death. Exar and Ulic stayed on Yavin while the Corsair was on its mission, and after some time they finally felt what they were waiting for, a major disturbance in the Force. Alima and Krado had succeeded in using the super weapon on one of the ten stars in the Kron Cluster near Complex 9, destroying the Jedi Republic Force as well as themselves, killing two birds with one stone. The weapon made one star implode, causing a chain reaction supernova between them all to shockwave the whole system, and as they planned, Ossus was last to be hit. They immediately set course for the doomed planet, which was in a state of panic and worldwide evacuation. 
Ulik and a group of Mandalorian fighters entered the atmosphere first and were engaged by his brother Kay and a number of Jedi defenders in the sky. Using this as a smokescreen, Exar was able to get inside the Jedi library without resistance, and as he walked down the ramp of the Star Storm 1, like an emperor claiming a conquered land, he ordered his Masasi followers to strip the library and load the loot in the ship. A Jedi master known as Ud Banar was trying to hide ancient Jedi lightsabers and scrolls inside a shielded vault that he hoped would protect them from the supernova. However, as he gently placed them inside, he felt a dark power emanating from behind him. Exar Goon. Ah, Master Ood, thank you for saving these artifacts. The tree-like Jedi Master activated his green lightsaber, prepared to protect the artifacts with his life. In turn, Exar activated his own unique lightsaber, and the two dueled. However, Ood was no match for Exar, a master duelist, and was also being overwhelmed by the Masasi Guardians defending him. In a last-ditch suicidal act, Master Ood, like a tree, rooted into the ground of Ossus over the artifacts, throwing back Exile with the Force and doubling in size, connecting with the planet's Force energy and becoming immovable. However, Ood was doomed, as he could never move from his state. And although Exile was disappointed in not getting the lightsabers, his Masasi plundered enough loot for him to consider the raid a success. As he returned to the Star Storm 1, Silver, once again out of nowhere, tried to jump Exile but was crowded out by his Masasi protectors, again deeming a duel with her to be unimportant. Exile rose from Ossus, leaving Silvar to the Masasi and leaving the planet to its fate, returning to Yavin 4. However, he also left Ulik, who was suffering from his own fate, unbeknownst to his master. Ulik lay on his knees, distraught, crying after killing his own brother in a fit of rage and being stripped from the Force by Nomi Sunrider. After the darkness clouding his mind had dissipated, he finally realised the things that he had done, and the things that Exar was going to do. I know where to find him. I can take you to Yavin 4. Exar stood atop a temple of his own making, oozing with confidence, but he was completely unaware that his war was about to come crumbling down in the blink of an eye. And as one man learned to find redemption in the light, another was soon to learn the suffering of imprisonment in the darkness. The jungles of Yavin 4 sat eerily quiet. The unusual dark skies and storms were replaced with peace. Exar stood upon his temple, staring into the unusually calm blue sky, relishing in his success in destroying Ossus. But unknown to him was the betrayal of his apprentice, Ulit Kaldroma, who had rejoined the Jedi Order. As the minutes passed, the sky was corrupted with dots that grew in size one by one. The peaceful quiet was replaced with the roaring of engines and hyperdrives. It was the Jedi. They had found him. Thousands upon thousands of starships, both fighter class and flagship arrived in the system to challenge him. And Exar knew regardless of his power, even he was incapable of contending with the combined might of the entire Jedi Order. Ulik, who led the order to Exar, reached out via communications, urging him to surrender, but that was not an option. He knew he was in the endgame now, and that soon he would be dead. However, he had discovered through the Jedi texts acquired on Ossus as well as Sith writings that he was able to transcend beyond mortality through an ancient ritual, and although it was sooner than he had hoped, it was time to put this knowledge into potentially devastating practice. Despite the text's information regarding the ritual, Exar wasn't completely sure of what would happen when intending to disconnect one's spirit from their body, and in knowing the risk, he ordered one of his greatest warriors known as Kalgrath to wait inside an isolation chamber beneath his temple as the last line of defence, should the ritual fail. Meanwhile, as he prepared, the Jedi combined together and conjured a massive wall of pure light energy around the moon to deter the aura of the dark side that it emitted, as well as hoping that it would cut the Sith Lord who was somewhere hiding below from the very force itself. However, this wall of light could not stop Exar, and his preparations were complete. He called forth every single Masasi that resided on the moon to his personal temple, the Temple of Exar Kun and chained himself to a great altar within the centre. One by one, the Masasi sacrificed themselves for their master, and their deaths empowered Sith artefacts within the room that began to release waves of dark energy into the chained Sith Lord. As the Masasi committed self-genocide, 
the energies grew stronger and stronger within the temple, sparking a devastating reaction with the wall of light surrounding the moon and ignited the jungles of Yavin 4 into a raging inferno, killing everything within its way. My spirit will live for ever. An exile reveled in his supposed victory as his body burned and disintegrated alongside the jungle surrounding him. Without its leaders, Exar's great war faltered and crumbled. The Mandalorians were defeated and withdrew from the conflict. His super weapons once feared were spent and the Krath were driven out and exiled into the Outer Rim. However, the effects of Exar's war would be continually felt throughout the now crippled Republic. As for the Jedi themselves, they deleted Yavin from their records and tried to falsely claim that it was they who defeated their fallen student. But Exar's failings and actions paved the way for new beliefs and ideologies, setting the galactic stage for an even greater evil yet to come. Darkness. That's all that was. As Exar opened his eyes, he was greeted with nothing but the Abyss. The ritual had worked, but at a price. Although his body was destroyed, his spirit remained, but was locked away in what felt like perpetual nothingness. Exar's spirit wandered aimlessly in the dark until he realised he was locked within his temple on Yavin, on a plane beyond that of the physical realm, and for the first time he was truly afraid, and for two long years he felt nothing, until for a moment he felt a glimmer of life. It was Ulik. Ulik! Why don't you answer me? Exar screamed and begged for his former apprentice to hear him, but so it seemed again, Ulik betrayed him. Don't leave me! ignoring the pleas of his former master, leaving him to suffer alone in the darkness. Ulik! Ulik? However, unbeknownst to Exar was that Ulik no longer felt the Force and couldn't hear Exar even if he wanted to. For hundreds of years, Exar wandered the dark catacombs of his temple and hoped that he would figure out a way to escape. And to his luck, during the Great Galactic War, Exar was freed for a brief period of time from the ethereal chains of his temple and wandered the jungles of Yavin 4 as the war raged on around him, even going as far as violently interacting with those that dared approach his spectral apparition. However, he was in the end too weak to do anything more than wander, and as the war on Yavin fizzled out, his spirit was once again pulled back and imprisoned into the eternal darkness of his temple, and Exar chose to no longer fight his fate. Instead, the spirit of Exar Kun slipped into a grand stupor, forgetting about the world around him, just as the world around him forgot about Yavin, binding his time and regaining whatever power he could until the right moment arrived. Exar's slumber lasted for over three and a half thousand years, falling further and further into endless darkness with seemingly no escape. This abyssal hell caused him to be almost utterly unaware of the world around him as it slowly became rediscovered over time to the very point where even the Rebellion's usage of his temples before and during the Battle of Yavin only briefly roused him to take a slight notice until he slipped back into sleep. Although, some months after when the Rebel Alliance used his very temple as a staging post for their evacuation, he did somewhat awaken. He reached out and possessed a number of Rebel soldiers, slowly feeding off of their residual energy to regain strength, but that wasn't enough and once the rebellion fled, Exar returned to slumber. Two years after the Battle of Yavin, an excavation team from Corellia came in search of the histories of all of the moon's marvellous temples, including the Temple of Exar Kun. However, these archaeologists delved a little too greedily into the dark, and unearthed a hidden catacomb underneath the temple, fully awakening the spirit of Exar Kun. As they ventured in one by one, Exar crushed their minds, dominating and controlling their wills, creating the fanatical cult of Exar Kun. But it was short-lasted, as a band of spacers infiltrated the tomb, slaughtering everyone until reaching Exar Kun's throne room. Exar tried to mimic a physical form, bringing to life some unworn robes, fighting the group using everything within his limited power to drive them back. But after just fully awakening, he was still too weak, and the spacers sent Exar Kun back into the abyss. However, instead of resting, Exar knew that if he were to regain form, he would need the power of highly force-sensitive beings, and although his spirit was limited to Yavin, Exar reached out, 
connecting to and pervading the dreams of a young man called Gantaris, appearing as a shadow, a dark man in his nightmares. Ten years after the events in the catacombs, Exar was now at the peak of his spiritual power, although still utterly limited by his spectral nature. However, the naive Jedi Master Luke Skywalker had re-established his new Jedi Order within the Great Temple, even training them around Exar's own temple, and he knew that this was his time to act. To his luck, one of Skywalker's apprentices was Gantaris, and Exar once again invaded his dreams, appearing as the Dark Man. Exar manipulated the apprentice, driving him towards the dark side, claiming that Luke was holding him back. Eventually though, Gantaris discovered Exar's true identity, but his impatience with his training led him to not care, and he opened up to the Sith Lord's teachings, even being guided to craft a double-bladed lightsaber as unique as Exar's once was. Exar also set his sights on Luke himself, again entering the Jedi Master's dreams, but this time masquerading as his father, Anakin, trying to manipulate Luke into studying the dark side. But Luke fought against Exar's words, and his robed visage transformed into a dark, consuming outline, forcing Exar out of his nightmare. After his failure with Luke, Gantaris also began to resist him. When Exar visited the young man, his spirit manifested through the cracks of stone walls like an oozing black liquid, trying to once more manipulate him, trying to spark his anger and rage. I want your anger. I want you to open the doorways of power. Exar's oozing black visage opened up to show a vision intended to break Gantaris's will, but the Jedi stood strong, igniting his familiar looking lightsaber and charging at the evil spirit, but Exar merely laughed and raised his ghostly hand, <laughs> igniting the force within Gantaris's body, incinerating his flesh from the inside, leaving nothing but a charred corpse. With Gantaris dead, a new Jedi arrived at the Praxium, the young Kip Jura. Kip's power was far beyond the other apprentices, who within a week of training had surpassed everyone in the academy, and became frustrated with Luke's slow-paced teachings. Exar visited the young man, once again manifesting through the cracks of the temple as an oily figure darker than darkness itself, offering power and knowledge. A curious Kip followed Exar's trail to his temple with his friend, Dorsk81, and when they arrived, Exar put Dorsk to sleep and proceeded to show Kip the power of the dark side. Kip, who wanted nothing but vengeance upon the Galactic Empire, warily accepted Exar's offer. Now twisted by Exar's manipulations, Kip rebelled against Luke's teachings and eventually fled the temple, claiming himself to be the new Dark Lord of the Sith to Exar's amusal. When he returned to Yavin, he called for Exar's aid in pulling an Imperial superweapon called the Sun Crusher from Yavin Prime over to Yavin 4 and even as Kip called upon the power of the temples and the dark side as Exar once did, it was not enough, and Exar's spirit swirled up behind the young fallen Jedi, tapping into him, bolstering his power beyond anything he had ever felt. As they piloted the Sun Crusher through the Force towards Yavin 4, Luke confronted his fallen apprentice, but once again Exar merely laughed. As the Jedi Master ignited his lightsaber, the hilt froze, and an oily shadow swirled around and swallowed up the beautiful green beam, and as the lightsaber died, Exar unveiled himself behind the Jedi. Luke kneeled and raised every defensive technique he could muster, but as Kit blasted Luke with lightning, Exar aided his apprentice with unfathomable power, raising what seemed to be sharp serpent-like shadows from the cracks of the temple that pierced Luke's flesh over and over, sundering his spirit from his now comatose body. Some time later, Luke's spirit, trapped within the same temple as Exar, screamed in hope that someone would hear him, but there was nothing. They can't hear you, Skywalker. Until Exar's tar-like spirit oozed from the temple walls and now reformed into a now clear figure of a man. But I can. Exar began to goad Luke on his failures as a master and mocked the Jedi for his spiritual imprisonment, who retaliated claiming that Exar had no power beyond their ethereal realm. I have had endless millennia to practice, so rest assured, Skywalker, I will destroy you." As Kip left Yavin and began a rampage with the Sun Crusher, Exar focused his attention on twisting the rest of Luke's pupils, all now without a master. After failing with Corrin Horn, his main focus turned towards the elderly stream, a Force Empath. 
Exile whispered dark things into Streen's mind, and with the intent of destroying Luke's body, during one dream, Streen encountered the Dark Man and conjured a force storm to try and destroy the Dark Spirit. But as he awoke, it was revealed that Exar had manipulated Streen into a trance who had almost killed the comatose Luke. After that failure, Exar tried to influence the battle hydra beasts of Yavin that descended from his once monstrous creations to attack the temple and Luke's body. But again, they were defeated, this time by Luke's young nephew Jason. As time passed, Exar met Luke in the ethereal plains of the temple, simply to strike fear into his heart. But Luke, Emboldened by Exar's failures, threatened the Sith Lord, and said that his fate was sealed due to his students' combined strength. Exar once again turned to Streen. As Streen watched upon Luke's body, Exar whispered into his ear, trying to control the old man to kill him once and for all. But he resisted, much to Exar's anger, and ignited Luke's green blade in defence. Exar's dark spirit formed in the centre of the room, towering as to strike fear into the Jedi's heart. But, another Jedi entered the room, Kirana T, igniting Gantaris's former lightsaber and threatening the momentous spirit too. One by one, twelve members of the Jedi Praxium encircled the enraged spirit, standing as one against the darkness. Exar raised his arms, swirling wind around the candles lighting the room and plunged the Jedi into darkness, but a beautiful blue light shimmered from the combined group, bringing light to the dark. Even joined together, you are too weak to fight me. Exar reached out through the Force, grabbing and choking all twelve members as his monstrous spectre grew in size. Exar watched as the life was sucked from each and every one, but Stream manipulated the air in the room and forced oxygen into the lungs of each Jedi. Now backed into a corner and desperate, Exar attacked their wills, trying to taunt and weaken them through their own insecurities and failures. But even then, their circle did not break, and to Exar's utter shock, no! he saw the spirits of his old master, Bodo Siosk Bas, join the circle. Exar Gorn, my student, you are defeated no! at last. No! Exar screamed as he desperately tried to break the circle, which was finally enclosed by the spirit of Luke. Kirana and Streen reignited the lightsabers, clashing them together as Exar's spirit struggled between them, sparking a blinding light which shattered the spirit of Exar Kun into fragmented shadow. Exar, split apart and screaming, frantically searched for a weak body to hide within, but the Jedi were not weak. They were together, unlike Exar who was once again alone. Streen began to conjure a force storm around the shredded shadow of Exar Kun that tightened and trapped him within a knotted cycle. The cyclone was raised to the open ceiling, and the billions of fragmented no. shadows were flung into no. the vast emptiness of space, no. vanishing no. with nothing more than a brief, no. distorted scream that faded into the nothingness of night. And after over 4,000 years, the horror that was Exar Kun was finally no more.